In this episode of Climate Gen, I'm speaking to Dr. Paul Behrens about the complexity of population, consumption and climate change. In his book, The Best of Times, The Worst of Times, Paul addresses population, presenting both a pessimistic potential outcome and also a more hopeful outcome based on a set of choices that we, especially those of us in wealthier, high-emitting countries, can make to improve the chances for a better future. One big barrier to a better future is the growing narrative that stokes fears around migration. The propagating of these myths falls under the title of eco-nativism, a term that Paul both defines and discusses in some detail. Population and migration are critical and controversial issues, and when placed in the context of continually rising emissions and consequent impacts, they stress the need for reflection on how we value our own life and the lives of all those around us. In the next episode, I'm speaking to Dr. Min Hee Go in South Korea about her recent book, Rethinking Community Resilience, that looks at the politics of disaster recovery in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. Minnie's research highlights the necessity to not just build back from catastrophe, but also how we must ensure community resilience as the frequency and extremity of these events increases. Thank you for listening to Climate Gen. You can follow this series on all major podcast channels, on YouTube, on my website, gen.cc, and you can also follow and support on Patreon. Oh, it's great to see you again. We're going to talk this time about population, and this is one aspect of the climate and ecological crisis that pops up on my comment feeds a lot. And it's kind of, it seems to always be the elephant in the room, and it's hard to talk about. And we can all agree that humanity is overshooting. But how bad is it when we look at the world today? It's it's really the, the wrong focus, uh, actually, uh, population. Um, when you say the word population, it comes up with all sorts of different colonial attitudes, um, controlling attitudes, uh, moral questions. Um, we can stand back and look at the statistics of population, and we can see that the fertility rates around the world are crashing very quickly, that uh, COVID, uh, rather than being a baby bump, has been a baby bust. Uh, we can perhaps talk about that in a bit. We can see that, for example, China posted the lowest fertility rate uh, it's ever seen, 1.3 children per woman uh, last year. Um, that means that you're going to see a crashing in population in the China by about 730 million uh, by the end of this century. It'll be the totally remarkable, absolutely the most wild demographic shift that we've ever seen. So in a sense, a lot of the population issues either don't come down to trying to directly control population or, you know, we're already on the downslope in many countries. Ultimately, the most important thing about population is women's autonomy and ability to plan their families. Okay, and you just mentioned a huge decline in Chinese birth rates, which is such a big figure. When you look at this as a collective around the world, what does this do to the UN forecast, which I think is something like nine and a half billion by the end of the century? Yeah, well, to, to put that into perspective, okay, so first of all, the population figures are, are far more uncertain than you might think. You know, you often think, oh, a population figure, we must surely know how many, how many people are in a country. And, and that's not necessarily the case. You know, these population figures uh, are actually uh, far uh, harder to get. With that said, the UN low variant model. So this is the lowest variant that they have um, out of the low, uh, medium, high variants that they look at. It suggests, for example, that Chinese fertility rates between 2020 and 2025 would be 1.45 per woman. And we're actually at 1.3 in, in, in 2020 at the start of that period. So we're already substantially below at the start of that period. Now, there's a lot of discussion amongst specialists about can we really trust these UN figures? Um, they've been pretty good in the past, but it does seem to suggest that they're missing some of the dynamics in terms of the acceleration and the reduction of fertility rates worldwide. And certainly if you look at some of the socioeconomic pathways, they're already uh, forecasting lower than the median variant. There are those that are concerned that you know, even the UN's lower variant is underestimating the reductions. You know, Essentially, the UN forecasts they're probably on the high side. And already the UN already drew the forecast down last year. They went from 10 to 9.7 billion, billion uh, by 2050. And I would not be surprised if it got even lower. And I would not be surprised if we never met 10 billion at all. I mean, it's looking quite unlikely now. Okay. And on this idea of never reaching 10 billion as a global population, is that because also 
not just fertility, but is, it, is there anything to do with um, available resources? Because this is a, a, an area that's constantly flagged up is that as population goes up, we're, we're consuming more than we, we can possibly produce on the planet. Is there anything yeah. to do with the carrying capacity of the earth in this? It's just, it's exceptionally hard to, to, to make any forecasts on that. that. That's, you know, there are so many different feedbacks or impacts that we could have. I mean, we could have a world um, much higher or lower in carrying capacity than that for the Holocene period. Now that we're moving out of the Holocene period, you know, you have uh, experts out there sort of suggesting, you know, if we move more towards some of the higher end trajectories, you're talking uh, a, a carrying capacity of 1 billion, you know, 1 to 4 billion, depending on how, how high you get in temperatures. Um, but it's extremely hard. I think for listeners who are really interested in how many uh, people can the earth support, there's a book of that name, um, which is a very sort of academic book that goes through all of the estimates over time. Um, very fascinating book. And, you know, in that book, it was anywhere between a billion to, I think, 60 billion. Uh, there were some estimates in the literature uh, a while back uh, from that. So it all depends on how we live. I mean, this is ultimately the real issue is the consumption side of things, uh, especially in high income nations. And, you know, so how we live is is, is more important than you know how many of us living okay and in terms of how we live you looked at sort of the current cost of what we're doing and if population is going to decline you know is it going to decline at a rate that is survivable for humanity i mean it, i know this is based on choices and your book is about choices in a way you've got a sort of hopeful path and a yeah. pessimistic path can you yeah. sort of identify the, the difference between the two that I mean, whether it's going to meet a certain finishing line, I can't say. What I, what I can say is give you some, some details on this. So yeah. the time it took for the UK to reduce from six children per woman to 4.5 children per woman uh, was 80 years. So it took a very slow decline. Rwanda recently did that in about five years. Iran dropped from about 4.5, I think it was, to about to replacement rate, which is about 2.1 children per woman, in about 11 years. And we're seeing a rapid acceleration in the declines in fertility around the world, and this is for good reasons. You know, this is because global literacy rates increased uh, 40 to 80 percent uh, between the 60s and, and 2015, and women were the largest part of that, and they had more control over their uh, family planning, their autonomy. And really, it's that that's driving it. You know, in, there was a really interesting article in Science in 2011, I think it was Science, that estimated that if not all nations took on the same rate as the rapid increase in female education in South Korea from that point, uh, you would have 500 million fewer people worldwide by 2050. And so that's not just a small change. That's a, that's a huge change, of course. I mean, you know, as I say, the UN has already brought its estimates down three hundred million. So I can't say whether any of this is fast enough. As I all I can say is that it depends far more on the consumption side of the ledger than the number side of the ledger. And this is borne out by papers uh, that we can see that look at the decomposition of what is driving carbon emissions, for example, yeah. for what is driving environmental impacts. And what you see in these papers uh, over and over again, and, and we've written papers like this too, is that it's the GDP, it's the wealth of the world that has the largest potential to increase impacts than the population uh, by an order of magnitude more. Um, now, some people would say, you know, and I've heard it said, you know, that um, we then have to see this increase in wealth in middle income nations. We're talking billions of people there. Right. So surely that's still a population issue. I think sort of yes and no. It actually still comes down to a consumption issue and to a choices issue by mainly the higher income nations. To give you an example there is that India managed to provide far more access to electricity at a very low carbon cost due to distributed uh, solar panels, uh, distributed energy. So they went from 25% of people having access to electricity to between, well, around 70% of the total population between 1981 and 2011. And that came in at a carbon cost, a cumulative carbon cost of just uh, 50 million tonnes of CO2. You think, oh, millions tonnes of CO2, that sounds like a lot. Well, that's a sixth of the UK annual emissions, you know, 
<laughs> and that's for a country that's 12 times the size of that sort of 650 million people that or 10 times the size of that 650 million people in India that got access to electricity. So I think if we in high income nations can double down on both the technologies and the implementation and deployment of those technologies, whilst cutting our own emissions and realigning society, you know, maybe it has to be a degrowth, maybe it can be growth agnostic, then we can really make that space for the remaining areas that are still growing or the remaining areas that are still going to get much richer. You know, so um, there is a way to sort of paint a picture where you're threading the needle here. Now, I'm the first to admit this is incredibly difficult and that we need to see all of the pointers go in the right direction. But one thing we often underestimate is sort of these changes in fertility rate, these changes in growth rates are really compounding over time and resulting in a very different world. Okay, you're talking about um, consumption in places like the UK, for example, versus India. And one of the big things is in this um, declining population scenario is that our economies are kind of built on our populations. We, are, we, need to, we need incoming to support the existing. This is something you touch on in your book regarding the migration issue and how we view migration. And I think mm. quite early on, you say that we've been migrating. Part of our, the definition of humans is, is migrating. And yet today it's been politicized, almost weaponized, and we're very territorial and it's all wrapped up in our national identities and things like that. Can you talk a little bit about the role of migration and how it could be used to the benefit of countries, say the European countries or UK or whatever? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, w- one thing I wanted to mention, actually, about the, uh, the, women's, uh, the, the women's planning and the women's autonomy, I, I just want to say, you know, that, that if, you're really, um, if you're really that worried about population, then you actually have to be a massive feminist, essentially. <laughs> you know, and I, you know, so I, I'm sure many people who are worried about population are, you know, massive feminists, but I'm sure many of them aren't. And, you know, often population is deployed in this very fraught way, uh, which has tinges of all sorts of uh, nasty sort of philosophies in, in, in the background. And that's not everybody. I'm sure some people are, you know, are talking about it in a very responsible way. And, and, and the, my main point is, is it, you know, if you are actually that worried about population, it really is quite simple. And that is empowering women around the world. Um, it's not that well correlated to um, wealth as, as much as it is to uh, family planning and access to uh, family planning and, and you know, the drawdown project that looked at 100 different uh, tech, you know, op- opportunities for cutting uh, emissions uh, found that family planning and women's autonomy, women's education combined were much higher than anything else, and, you know, equivalent to all of the on- and offshore wind uh, combined. And David Roberts has a very good piece on Vox about this, which uh, is a really good read on that. In terms of migration, you know, if you look at what's happening around the world, of course, the changes in these fertility rates are very regionally specific. Um, I think a lot of us have images of what the fertility rate is that's kind of decades out of date now. <laughs> you know, so really the only remaining areas that are still growing are uh, areas in uh, some areas in Africa and some even fewer areas in, in Southeast Asia. Um, and the areas that are shrinking are shrinking quite fast. You know, and I've mentioned China already. If we if we look towards uh, Europe, uh, Europe is estimated to lose about 1.4 million working age people per year by 2050. Um, that's working age people because we're we're obviously aging. So the actual number of people we're losing is closer to I think it's something like 100 800 thousand people. But because we're aging so much more, we're also uh, losing working age people. And as you say, that's going to have a huge impact on the economics, uh, the economies. Um, And just to put that in perspective, 1.4 million per year is higher than the highest influx in Syria during the Syrian refugee crisis, you know? So there um, there is this balancing act going on. We're seeing a very, very rapid reduction, even more after COVID. Um, Some of the Mediterranean countries saw very fast declines last year. Meanwhile, some of the areas that are gonna see most of the climate harm, yes, they're still shrinking too, but they'll see some, some remaining growth. And you can perhaps see where this is going. I mean, if you are a country that actually requires a certain support ratio, you know, um, that we've got this pension time bomb, then we're seeing a sort of balancing out of populations around the world that is almost perfectly mapped to historic ethical harms uh, and also climate harms, you know, the areas that are most have most because the issues that people are now experiencing in some, some, not all, but some of the uh, remaining areas of the world that are still growing are areas that are shrinking. So this is a really important um, opportunity 
opportunity, I think. And we could perhaps talk a little bit more about migration and the impacts that it has as well on, you know, other impacts it has on the environment. That was kind of my point. I wasn't sort of saying that we're going to force people to migrate to, to sort out our economic <laughs> problems, but it was the, the people who are being forced to, because of whatever conflict, climate, it's in our sort of, it's in our interest to welcome them. And, but we don't see it like that at the moment. We see no. this as a very much a future threat. And we're not yeah. really aware of, of what's going on in our own society in terms of depletion and hardship in the future. One of the things I wanted to talk about is how do we start? I mean, I think in your book, you say, you know, we need to consider this. This is part of our sort of solution. How do we start having that conversation on a, on a larger scale? I mean... Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I think as with a lot of other human issues, um, you have to start seeing the impacts of it first. And I, I think we're starting to get an appreciation of that in the UK, for example, with uh, some of the Brexit fallout and basically not having the staffing and labour, you know, in certain areas and sectors of society. And you're starting to see this conversation shift already. Every now and then you see something come out that's kind of migration positive. So, you know, you saw some of the, the discussion about Syrian refugees in Germany, for example, and, you know, the production of one of the COVID vaccines. And, you know, you do see this highlighted. I think the groups that are very much um, trying to change the conversation on this seem to be coming, uh, becoming quite sophisticated now. You know, the sort of the groups that are trying to build a, a very positive argument for migration. And I, I hope to see some more of that working out. So I think one of the things we've got to remember, and this actually feeds back to one of the reasons why populations have crashed in many areas of the world. For example, Ethiopia. One of the reasons why Ethiopia's fertility rates have, have reduced is, yes, women's uh, autonomy, access to planning, planning, but also things like uh, soap operas uh, that we're talking about both education but also what do we want from life what do we want from our families what do we want from our communities and a lot of that is a sort of you know for bad or worse a homogenization of sort of attitudes in higher income nations and other middle income nations about what they see as the future in their families and so one of the reasons i bring this up is that people are worried about sort of the cultural implications of migration and, and this is a, can only be really be a hypothesis but it does appear to me that some of the cultural similarities between countries and the attitudes between countries are, are much more similar than they ever were. And this is not a universal, we're not totally homogenous in some universalist idea, but some of these cultural issues may not be the same issues that we see in the future as we saw in the past. And of course, if you're actually going to address some of these things, then you really need to invest in people. So you've got to change this argument from investing lots in border forces, in all sorts of control, in internment camps, uh, all these sorts of things, and changing this to a real investment in people, which um, Germany did very well with the Syrian example, but, you know, poorly in other examples. You know, they really provided uh, language classes, integration classes, uh, buddy systems, all sorts of different things to allow uh, them to really benefit from the migration they had. And all the reports that have come out since that have estimated, because we're far away now from it, that we can see the impacts have been really hugely positive. Okay. And you mentioned Brexit there. Do you think that there's um, quite a lot that could be learned from from Brexit, <laughs> when you kind of analyse the impacts, I mean, they've pretty much universally been bad because of the reasons which we're talking about. <laughs> they've blocked immigration, the workforce fell away, and the country can't, can't do what it wants to do. And on another side of that was London, which was is such a culturally rich city with pockets of diversity everywhere, is mm. held up as a... You know, people love it for that reason. And so there are ways that we can coexist, protect some of our cultural identity or you know, as much as we want and still live harmoniously. Do you think those are things that sort of feature in this, this sort of discussion in a way? Yeah, so I'm no expert or political commentator on, you know, national, um, you know, na national appetite for, for migration. I, from from what I understand from others, um, there has been a shift towards just more and more negative, up until the Brexit vote, more and more negative messaging about migration. Um, certainly when I was uh, a kid, it, it, you know, it, there was a lull in the discussions about it. You know, it wasn't such a, a huge hot, hot button issue. Uh, and then it became, you know, just very, very, the, the most important thing, you know, surrounding Brexit. Now that we've seen the consequences of that, you know, you, you might hope that, 
you can see why this is this wasn't you know a good idea but those sorts of outcomes need to be communicated now honestly and i think the problem in the uk at the moment is there's still not a lot of honesty around what's actually going on yeah. uh, or you know it's not actually making the front pages of news you know you have to go to just read your reports and dig down into sort of lines here and there about what the actual benefits are and they're very you know there are none uh, in, in in that uh, area this kind of touches on something else you mentioned called eco-nativism and this is very much sort of what seems to be trickling into the media. And mm. can you can you define that term and just put it in its own context of, of this conversation? Yeah. So th- this is a, this is a sort of a, a, maybe a lifeboat mentality where you're using the oars to push people off. You know the you know the, the, the lifeboat. And the idea being that we can have a low impact, uh, and what we need to do is stop anybody else coming over here because they will naturally sort of degrade the environment, and we will use migration as a scare tactic to talk about why we need to address climate change and these sorts of arguments. And I think as we've been discussing about the sort of uh, trends in demographics, for example, these are not very helpful. Uh, These are very dangerous concepts, really, because the exact sorts of things that we need in order to address climate change, which is more collaboration between lower and middle income nations and high income nations, uh, more flows of funds, more efforts in diffusing technologies and low carbon technologies around the world are inimicable if we're going to start drawing up draw bridges. I guess, you know, the characterization here is the EU versus the world, eco-nativism or whatever. But you can see eco-nativism across middle income nations too, you know, uh, between India and Bangladesh, for example. There are obviously clearly, you know, very deep cultural uh, reasons as well for that. But, you know, arguably, you can see the climate issue as being another clear driver there. It's sort of the wrong trend at the wrong time. You know, it, it sort of exacerbates. I mean, if we want to go into the pessimistic scenario, we can, we can think of all sorts of ways in which this would end up in badly. You mentioned of how it can go badly, and I've already interviewed um, a former Pakistani general and defence minister who said he thought the war with India was inevitable as things got, wow. as the climate got worse. And I, th- I think that was a very striking sort of pathway to chaos, basically, if we don't make the right choices. And this idea of eco-nativism, the way you've described it, is something that we, once you understand it, you can kind of call it out when mm. you see it. And I think that's mm-hmm. that's one thing we're going to have to get quite good at is calling these things out. Yeah. Uh, because ultimately we know it's not a preference. They actually lead us in the wrong direction. It's not, you know. Yeah. And, 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 and like to a certain extent, like what do we want? <laughs> You know, what do we want from our countries? Uh, in, what do we want from our environments? I mean, if you look at South Korea is demolishing schools because they have no children to teach. <laughs> well, they have some different children to teach, but fewer children to teach. Um, Germany is uh, demolishing some neighborhoods. Um, the vacancy rates in Italy, you know, across Spain, you know, sometimes reach up to, you know, 20 percent, 10 to 20 percent. You know, do, do you want a slow death? of you know communities not to mention the carbon emissions involved in that infrastructure and buildings you know one thing we're looking at at the moment is you know what would happen if you did manage migration very well and reduce the amount of building that you have to do because if we've got this imbalance in regions around the world and maybe this is a very technocratic view but i think you know it's worthwhile exploring if you've got this imbalance in populations and uh, buildings around the world and access to shelter well then maybe uh, as we start to empty in uh, in higher and even some middle income nations then you know maybe there's an opportunity to offer more both shelter you know and sanctuary uh, in from other regions so it's also what do you want do you want a non creative non dynamic slowly dying out country or do you want something that's you know more dynamic something that's um you know morally um you know beneficial and correct and and something that's sort of maybe a little bit more exciting going forwards and i think that's the sort of argument you have to make at the econativists because if you're looking at econativists yeah you'll just slowly shrink you know into nothingness (laughs) as a country not to mention all of the economic woes as you do that yeah well it's a great question to ask ourselves and and to raise with others i think but um this is really to end on the your book, The Best of Times, The Worst of Times, provides two sides to every area that you cover. And there's the pessimistic side, which um, is where a lot of us tend to focus. It's hard not to. And then there's the hopeful side, where a lot of us would like to move towards. Mm. And where do you sit on your own spectrum of pessimism and hope when, when you switch off the lights at night? And what's the one thing that you see as the most hopeful out of when we'll just stick with population for the moment? Yeah, um, obviously, I. this is one of the things I think about the way in which we communicate pessimism and hope, because I think we go back and forth. And I think a lot of scientists have been deep in a well 
uh, uh, in, in periods as well. You know, they go really, really bleak. Um, you know, some people call it doomist but, uh, or alarmist. And I don't think that it's static like that. I think we move back and forth, you know, between most days. I, I think in a personal, emotional sense, um, I'm quite negative. I wouldn't say I still have a huge amount of hope. But I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm mostly, I'm mostly more on the upset side. If that, that, I don't want to say that I'm just pessimistic because that just implies that I've just been giving up. Uh, but I think, um, I, you know, when we look at things like population, and you look at some of the dialogue around the world, you look at some of the upheaval that's happening, some of the ways in which um, areas of politics, areas of society are already taking on board those eco nativist uh, talking points. Um, I'm really concerned that this is just going to, ex you know, um, expand very much uh, and dominate the discourse uh, as, you know, climate impacts get worse. On the hopeful side, when you look at the, the hopeful side, I mean, we just have to look at the evidence, you know, the Syrian uh, refugee crisis, you know, there's some controversy in the literature, but at least partially has been driven by climate change, um, partly driven by uh, drought. And what happened when... Germany, mostly Germany, but other countries like uh, Sweden too, just took a decision and said, "Yes, come in. We're going to make. We're going to build good systems to support you." What was the outcome? What pretty wonderful, like pretty pretty amazing. Um, also arrested some of the you know pop Germany's own population declines. So there's some evidence for you that this can work out well. And, you know, obviously on the pessimistic side, we've got, you know, uh, refugee camps in Greek islands and all the rest of it. You know, I mean, it, it's not one picture where, you know, you can just say, yes, there's this hope and yes, this is pessimism. And I think we have to try and keep those two things in our minds at the same time. You know, it, it, the word, it is simultaneously true that we are failing on so many different things, but it's also true that we have seen it quite amazing examples of things working out uh, and quite amazing change and rapid changes in the way that we think about the world and also the, fundamentally the demographics and the impacts that we have on the planet. Okay, well, that's a great place to, to end at the moment. Um, yeah, somewhere between the two. <laughs> and um, yeah, and I look forward to speaking to you again shortly uh, and focusing more on, on food systems because I think that interface is very much with the population issue. I know we, we've kind of purposefully excluded it here, but um, it'd be great to talk to you about that as well. Oh, that's actually one thing that I, I should have mentioned. I mean, this carrying capacity, you know, the carrying capacity of a world of vegans is very different to a carrying capacity of your average American diet, you know? I mean, it's just miles apart. And that's why some of these estimates, you know, you can get up to 60 billion because, you know, if you are, if you do, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a life of abstinence of sacrifice, you know, uh, it can be a life of exploration still. Um, so it really this population question, it's just, it's just kind of not the right question to, to ask, although it's very interesting to look at the data and to talk about um, women's, uh, women's autonomy. Okay, brilliant. Okay, well, there's one feminist to another. We'll end there. <laughs> Thanks again for listening. If you are interested to help support this series and help expand the discussion around climate topics, then please do consider backing my channel via Patreon. It will help me produce more content and you will also gain access to more expert interviews. It would be great to engage more with audiences too and understand your views on these topics.